Hey everyone, going live in five minutes. Um, can someone in the chat let me know if you guys can hear me?
Hey everyone, welcome back. We're on episode 14 of the John Verveke Watch Party. Uh, today we're going to be discussing Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, Epicurean, Cynics, and Stoics. Um, so as always, we do this watch party every uh, Monday at 9 a.m. PST, 5 p.m. GMT. Then we do a discussion about one hour later. We'll take like a 10-minute or so intermission, um, and then we'll jump into the discussion. Uh, and as always, UV is going to be doing uh, show notes, just taking notes in a Google Doc, and you guys can access that at futurethinkers.org slash notes. That'll forward you to the D Google Doc. And then after the watch party is finished and before we do the discussion i'll give the link for you guys to join the video chat and i encourage you to join you know and just add to the conversation or get clarification uh, there's no such thing as stupid questions uh, we we're happy to accommodate everyone and bring more people into the conversation and we we yeah we want the diversity of opinions so welcome everyone all right i think that's it unless i'm forgetting anything yeah am i forgetting anything <laughs> Okay, no. All right, cool. Let's get into it. Um, this is episode 14, and we'll see you in an hour. Welcome back to Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. Last time we finished our look at the Axial Revolution in India. We took a look at um, what was going on uh, in uh, the Buddha's state of enlightenment. We took a look at some of the cognitive science in such awakening experiences. And then we moved to interpret, uh, uh, following the sage advice of Batchelor, some of the Buddha's uh, pronouncements, trying to get beyond interpreting uh, his pronouncements as uh, propositions to be believed, and instead understand them as provocations so that we may enact enlightenment. And that means enacting the threat that we are facing, and then enacting the psychotechnologies that can respond to it. We took a look at this in terms of ideas of parasitic processing, reciprocal narrowing, addiction, and the opposite of anagogic acceleration as opposed to reciprocal narrowing, and creating a counteractive dynamical system, um, the counteractive system of the Eightfold Path for successfully dealing with parasitic processing. So we saw that these higher states of consciousness, these awakening experiences, can bring about transformations that alleviate modal confusion, parasitic processing, uh, reciprocal narrowing, all many of the ways in which we fundamentally lose our agency in the world in a self-deceptive and self-destructive manner. I'd now like to return back to uh, what's happening after the Axial Revolution in the West. So Socrates was fortunate. Um, he had a great disciple in Plato. Plato was fortunate and that he had a great disciple in Aristotle. Aristotle had a great disciple, but he was not so fortunate. Aristotle's great disciple is not himself a great philosopher. He is another kind of great. He is Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great is an example of the kind of thing that predates the Axial Revolution, the world conqueror Alexander creates an empire and takes the Greek way of thinking throughout most of the known world in a way that reestablishes, in perhaps a dangerous manner, the preaxial world. Alexander is so glorious that the line between being a human being and being a god is blurred. He creates a personal mythology in which he is a god man very much like the pharaohs of ancient Egypt, which might perhaps explain why uh, Alexander was so readily welcomed into uh, the courts of Egypt. Either way, what happens is a twisting of the world. Because not only does, Aris uh, not only does Alexander represent 
a return to a preaxial way of being. He also represents a fundamental disruption to the world in which people had found themselves. Let's compare the world of Aristotle to the world of Alexander. Okay. Now, in order to do that, we have to understand that Alexander himself does not live very long. He dies in Babylon, that most ancient of cities. And it's not clear what he dies of as a young age of 33. He has a child, but the child, of course, is too young and is therefore quickly killed. And <clears throat> um, his major generals fight amongst themselves, and they carve his empire up into four smaller empires that are perpetually at war with each other for about 300 years. So this period is known as the Hellenistic era. So if you're alive at the time of Aristotle, chances are you live, if you're Greek, part of the Greek culture, you live in a polis. This is where we get cosmopolitan from. It doesn't mean city, it means a city-state. right? Like, for example, Athens and its surrounding agricultural supporting environment, or Sparta. Now, you know many of the other citizens. You know them face to face. We mentioned the idea that, you know, Athens is developing democracy. Remember when we d discussed the sophists, and at least for the adult males. And that's a significant defect in this society, but I've already gone into that. You're participating in your government in a direct manner. You live close to, it's accessible to you, the seat of that government. You often know personally people involved in the government, sometimes even the leaders themselves. Everybody around you speaks your language. Everybody around you has ancestors like you yourself do, stretching back beyond memory, who have lived in this place. Everybody around you has the same religion as you. Everybody has basically the same allegiances to this place. See, your polis just isn't just where you lived. Your polis is like such a tight relationship between agent and arena that one of the greatest punishments you could suffer in this world, the world of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, is to be ostracized, which is just, you're not killed, you're not imprisoned, you're not punished in any way, you're just told to leave the polis. And for many people, they would rather die or face imprisonment than be ostracized because the polis was such an embedded existence for them. Their identity was so enmeshed in it. So see, look at how deeply connected you are to yourself, to your environment, to the people around you, to your government, to your culture, to your history. Alexander comes and smashes all of that. Greek culture is now distributed into Africa, the Levant, into Asia, Asia Minor, Asia Proper, right down to, uh, down, out to the borders of India. You have Greek kingdoms, Bactria, that are integrating Greek culture with Buddhist philosophy and religion in what is modern day Afghanistan. Now what does this mean? Well, this means in the Hellenistic era, people are being moved around and shuffled around, and they're belo they belong to far-flung empires. You are now probably thousands of miles away from the seat of government. You do not participate in that government, nor do you know personally most of the people or any of the people in it. The people around you might not have lived where you're living, very long. You might not be living where you've been living very long. Your ancestors might have been from Athens, and here you are dwelling in Asia Minor. The people around you speak different languages, worship different gods. Notice how all the connections are being lost. You don't have a connection to a polis. You don't have a connection to a, a, a shared linguistic group of any great extent. Shared history, shared ancestry, shared religion. You're experiencing what Porteus and Smith and Brian Walsh called domicide. We'll come back to this later when we talk about the meaning crisis today. Domicide is the destruction of home. Now, there's two ways in which domicide can occur. One, of course, is physical destruction of your house. 
and that's important. But there's also cultural domicile, in which you have a house, you have a dwelling, but it is not very much your home. Now we'll come back to this being unhomed again when we talk about our current situation. But notice how often we will use the language of loss of home to describe our current situation. We're, we often talk, talk about how we now feel unhomed in the cosmos. So people are experiencing this radical sense of domicile. They don't have deep connections to themselves, to each other, to their environment, to their history, to their cultural surroundings. They have very little, uh, very little political participation. They feel insignificant. You can go to sleep and you're part of the Ptolemaic Empire and you wake up and you're part of the Seleucid Empire. So this is known as an age of anxiety, the Hellenistic period. The art changes. It becomes much more frenetic becomes much more realistic, it becomes much more organized around uh, sort of extremes and tragedy. The confidence that we saw in the earlier periods, the period of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle is gone. Greece itself has suffered a titanic civil war, the Peloponnesian War. So Sparta defeats Athens, the home of Socrates and Plato, one of the places where Aristotle did most of his work. Sparta is it very quickly itself defeated by Thebes. Thebes is very quickly loses its hegemony. So the Greek world loses, loses, and loses until, of course, it's overwhelmed by Macedonia and Alexander. So whereas the Greek culture is spread throughout the world. It's also thinned. It loses its depth. So there's a change that starts to happen. You can see, as I said, in the art, the, uh, the expression of this. You can see it in what starts to happen in religions. There's a lot of syncretism. People are trying to create religions that integrate different cultural deities together. A Greek deity, for example, and an Egyptian deity are integrated together, and perhaps into Serapis or something like that. You also see the elevation of mother goddesses to pan-cultural importance, like the mother goddess Isis, because, of course, when you feel domicile, when you feel a loss of home, there is nothing that means home more to you than mother. And if you don't have that with your physical mother, what you want is some right, divine mother that can make you feel at home no matter where you are in this fractured, domicile-laden world. But philosophy also responds. The axial age has left a powerful legacy with Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. And that project does not come to an end. But it does undergo transformation in the face of the Hellenistic meaning crisis. Up until now, the main thing that wisdom was trying to deal with was foolishness. And that's not abandoned, but that's now seen as insufficient. So one of the great philosophers of the Hellenistic period is Epicurus. And Epicurus famously said, call no man a philosopher who has not alleviated the suffering of others. So there's now a therapeutic aspect to wisdom. Wisdom is now importantly about dealing with the anxiety and suffering that people are experiencing in the Hellenistic era. So a new model is created. So we've seen the idea, right, of the sage as somebody like Socrates who provokes the Axial Revolution, leads you out of the cave, all of these wonderful 
and powerful images and figures, but a new metaphor emerges. The philosopher is the physician of the soul. A philosopher is somebody who can cure you of existential suffering. This becomes crucial. Now, many of these new philosophical schools, the Epicureans, for example, and the Stoics, take it upon themselves to try to exemplify Socrates. Right? They try to exemplify Socrates. The Epicureans do this in a very unique ma way. They do this in a, a, a useful way of analy uh, uh, analyzing their position is to take them up on their own metaphor. What is their diagnosis of the disease that is afflicting people, and what is their prognosis for the cure? Now, the Epicureans are very relevant to us because they, in some ways, represent a very secular alternative in the midst of what was still a very religious world. And that is pertinent to us. So the Epicureans diagnose that our main problem is fear. Now that's interesting, and there's something right about that, but we have to slow down first. And here's in order to get closer ab about how we should try and appropriate what they're saying, the work of Paul Tillich here is especially uh, useful, especially the work he does, uh, does in his masterpiece, The Courage to Be. Although he does not talk about the Epicureans very much, he concentrates on the Stoics, as we will as well, he nevertheless brings up important distinctions. This is the distinction between fear and a word you heard me use more often, which is anxiety. Now these terms are often used interchangeably, and we often and we also mix up the word anxiety with eagerness. We'll say, I'm so anxious to see you tonight. That's horrible. You shouldn't be anxious to see somebody. That means you're distressed, right? And you're suffering a loss of agency, and you have a nebulous sense of threat. That's, that person's terrifying. What you mean is you're eager to see them. So first of all, give up that meaning of anxious. Secondly, we use these terms interchangeably. And, you know, in everyday discourse, that's probably all right, because they do overlap in some ways. But they're important. it's important to at least talk about the polar differences between them. Fear is when you have an observable direct threat. The ti if a tiger comes into this room, I experience fear because I have an observable threat. In a, in a very important sense, I know what to do. I may fail in doing it, but I know what to do. Okay? Anxiety is different. Anxiety is when the threat is nebulous. You're not quite sh sure what the threat is, and you're not sure what to do. You don't know what to do. So very often when you're suffering existential issues, you experience anxiety. This is why this is the preferred term used by Kierkegaard or Heidegger. Although Kierkegaard does use fear in, in, in one of his books. But that has more to do with something else. So the Epicureans are often translated, I think, correctly. I'm not talking about, I'm not making a scholastic point, as talking about how we are suffering because we can't manage fear. I think a better way of understanding it, given this distinction and following on Tillich, is we suffer because we can't manage our anxiety. Because they think the fears they talk about are not really things that are a clear threat where we clearly know what to do. Okay.
So according to the Epicureans, basically we don't control our imagination or, and our thinking, and so we suffer from anxieties that cripple our ability to get a grip on the world. So let me give you one. Many people are anxious about death. In fact, sort of prototypically, people will often say, well, they'll often use the existence of death as a way of talking about how their, how their life is ultimately meaningless. I'm going to die anyways. What does it matter? I'm going to die. And it's terrifying. I don't, like, it's going to, it's odd. I'm just afraid of death. We know that if you expose people to triggers about their own mortality, they become cognitively rigid, they go into something very much like this parasitic processing, they get locked down, right? Now, there's, there's a couple things you can do. You can pursue immortality. And of course, the religions of the ancient world and some versions of the modern world offer this. I have very little to say for this other than as a cognitive scientist, I think that is an utterly doomed strategy. The evidence that your mind and your consciousness are completely dependent and emergent from your brain is overwhelming. And one thing is indisputable, your brain dies. And when your brain dies, your consciousness, your character, yourself die with it. I know that's even, I suppose, antithetical to what many Buddhists believe, but that's, that's irrelevant. So I think the strategy of pursuing immortality is not going to work. It makes a fundamental confusion. It confuses somebody, something that's phenomenologically in, like mysterious to you with making a conclusion. Look, I can't experience my own death. I can't imagine it. Because whenever I'm trying to imagine being dead, I'm still consciously aware. And so death is like, oh. And therefore I conclude, well, I, there must be something about me that's right, immortal because it's inconceivable that I can't be at some level. But of course that's false. And that points to what the Epicureans talk about, right? They, put, they talk about, there's another strategy. Instead of trying to achieve immortality, can you radically accept your mortality? Because it's indisputable that you're going to die. Now, how do you do that? Well, first of all, realize that you can't possibly be anxious about your death. And you say, yes, I am. OK, well, give the Epicureans a chance. First of all, if what you mean by this, your non-existence, and you say, ah, I just I can't conceive of my non-existence. Well, OK, this is, this is a standard move by Epicurus. Well, what about all of the world before you were born? Do you have trouble conceiving of that? No. Does it terrify you that you didn't exist then? No. So your non-existence isn't itself terrifying. And you say, ah, but it's, it's the loss. Well, the problem with that, the Epicureans would say, is that's equivocal. Do you mean right, reduction, or you do, mean, do you mean the absence? And you mean, well, death is total loss. And then they say to you, ah, but you can't ever experience total loss. They famously said the following, where I am, death is not. Where death is, I am not. What that means is, if I'm aware that I'm losing, I'm still alive. And if I've lost everything, I've lost awareness. And I can't be aware that I've lost anything. So that can't be what it means. OK? So it means partial loss. Ah. So what you're actually afraid of is losing some of your agency. You're afraid of some of the reduction in your capacities 
as you're dying. But of course, you're doing that all the time. So what is it you're actually afraid of? Well, the Epicureans say you're afraid of losing what's good. Okay, well, what, what does that mean? And here, here's where the Epicureans, they are, are sort of very, very modern, right? They say, well, good is ultimately, you know, something like pleasure, and they got associated with hedonism, and that's not quite right. But they don't mean pleasure in terms of bodily sensation. They mean pay attention to those things that actually give you the most meaning. Oh, okay. Now, what is it that really gives you meaning? Now, the things that we are, li we are most liable to lose as we age or as we're sick, we're liable to lose our fame, we're liable to lose our fortune, right? We're li liable to lose our wealth. That's scary. But then they say, quite rightly, but those aren't the things that give you the most meaning in life. What is it that gives you the most meaning in life? And here's where the Epicureans have a beautiful, sort of beautiful answer, and they pick it up from Socrates. The thing that gives you meaning is friendship. And they mean that very broadly. So they were unique in their community. They included women in their community, not primarily for sexual relations, but they considered that the ability to obtain meaningful relationships was crucial. And with those, and okay, meaningful relationships, not just the relationships, but being able to exercise philosophia, the pursuit of wisdom and self-transcendence. And the point is that as long as you are that is always available to you. And that any of the pain you're suffering from the loss of any of, the, uh, any of these things is ultimately manageable by you. You can learn to manage it. Now, whether or not you ultimately agree with the Epicureans, right? do you see what they're doing here? They're refusing to accept, I'm afraid of death. They're saying, wait, 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 wait. Are you? Do you really want immortality? They're saying, what you're actually afraid of is losing your agency, which you've identified with these things, but that's not actually where your ultimate happiness lies. That as long as you have cognitive agency, you can cultivate philosophical friendships. And Epicurus did this right to his very last moment, even though suffering from some horrible stomach illness. So he exemplified what he's talking about, such that when you die, it doesn't matter to you. So his disciples, pract they would, and, and Epicurus had other ways. He tried to get us to not be anxious about the gods, right? famously crafting some of the first arguments that are used by modern-day atheists against, you know, being concerned about the gods. I, don't, I wouldn't say Epicurus was an atheist. He's a non-theist. He basically argues that the gods are irrelevant. And therefore, paying attention to them or being overly concerned with them, being anxious about them and their nebulous threat is not something you should rationally do. So, Epicurus' disciples would practice internalizing Epicurus. They would write his sentences on their household walls, on their household utensils. They would practice. They would form communities together where they would reinforce all of these practices where you constantly train in being able to accept your mortality. Now, I think this is valuable to us. And I think one of the things that any wisdom tradition should do is give us a way of responding to our mortality. 
I would recommend that that project doesn't stop. I recommend Tillich's book, The Courage to Be, as a discussion about that from a more modern context. And as I said to you, we are not caught by the usual framing, right? Either you believe in an afterlife or your life, your current life is meaningless. Instead, the Epicureans say there's an alternative strategy, there's an alternative therapy for dealing with the anxiety, and that is by learning how, not just learning beliefs, but learning how to live in the acceptance of your mortality. Now, while I think this is relevant, I don't think that their diagnosis is sufficient. I do not think that the meaning crisis of the Hellenistic period was driven primarily or solely by a fear of mortality. Why? Because mortality has always been with us and always will be with us. I think they're right that periods of chaos and domicide exacerbate. We know this from mortality salience research, right? Things that are making us feel more vulnerable tend to make our mortality and our terror around it more salient to us. But I think there's another school that gets a better understanding of what was going on in the Hellenistic period and gives a more comprehensive answer. And this is the Stoic school. Now, Stoicism is very relevant because Stoicism is a direct and explicit ancestor to some of our current forms of psychotherapy. The current forms of psychotherapy that are the most evidence-based for being effective, the cognitive therapies like cognitive therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, rational emotive therapy, etc., directly come out of Stoicism. You read Aaron Beck's book, for example, on cognitive therapy, he repeatedly states this and cites Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius, and others. So the way we are trying to deal with issues of anxiety, and if you've probably noticed, we have an anxiety depression crisis in our culture, is we are very much putting into practice things that originated with the Stoics. Not as much from the Epicureans. So that means the Stoics have a different diagnosis of the problem and a different prognosis for the answer. So what's their issue? They also believe we're suffering from a kind of anxiety, a kind of suffering of a loss of agency and the, the distress around that, because that's, of course, what's shared by all of these schools confronting uh, the Hellenistic uh, crisis, meaning crisis, the crisis of domicide. But they have a different interpretation of it. Now, we have to do a bit of history. There's, a there's quite a bit more history that comes out of, uh, out, directly out of Socrates and flows into Stoicism. I want to go over this a little bit carefully with you. So, we have Socrates, and we know one of his greatest disciples is Plato, but he has another one, Antisthenes. Plato wrote dialogues because he was trying to get us to emulate and eventually internalize Socratic and Lenkus, that question and answer process that Socrates made famous. When Antisthenes was asked what he had learned from Socrates, he argued, he didn't argue, he just simply stated, he didn't make an argument, he just simply stated that he learned how to converse with himself. Now, that sounds like, well, I talk to myself all day long. Okay, so that's exactly the thing. This doesn't mean, right, your internal, just talking to yourself. It doesn't, 
And, and the problem with that is that talking to yourself is often what goes seriously awry in anxiety and depression. This is what psycho psychologists and psychotherapists mean by rumination, when that talking to yourself gets caught up in those parasitic processing spirals and it just spins out of control. Antisthenes means something else. He means he learned to do with himself what Socrates was able to do with him. He really learned how to internalize Socrates. So although the Epicureans, right, pattern themselves on Socrates, they come out of Socrates, right, the Stoicism is really something close to being a religion that's trying to internalize Socrates. So that Socrates is basically, and I don't mean this disrespectfully because the Stoics certainly wouldn't, Socrates is turned into a systematic set of psychotechnologies that you internalize into your metacognition. So what became crucial for Plato, as we saw, was argumentation. But for Antisthenes, the actual confrontation with Socrates was more important. Both Plato and Antisthenes are interested in the transformation that Socrates is affording. Plato sees this happening through argumentation. Antisthenes sees it as happening through confrontation. And you, you can see how they're both right. Because in Socratic Alenkus, Socrates comes up and he argues with you. But of course, he's also confronting you. We talked about how he's sort of slamming the actual revolution into your face. So Antisthenes has a follower. Diogenes, and Diogenes epitomizes this, this confrontation. And by looking at the kinds of confrontation, we can start to see what the followers of Antisthenes are doing. So Diogenes basically does something analogous to provocative performance art. He, tr he gets in your face in a way that tries to provoke you to realizations, those kinds of insights that will challenge you. He tries to basically create a poria in you, that shocked experience that you had when confronting Socrates that challenges you to radically transform your life. But instead of using argumentation and discussion as Socrates did and Plato picked up on, they were really trying to hone in on how to try to be as provocative as possible. Right? So famously you know about one of these. It became a card in the tarot and it became a album cover for Led Zeppelin. You have the man right, with the, with the lamp walking, wandering about, the hermit with the lamp. Well, this is Diogenes. He walked into the marketplace carrying around a lamp and looking and looking and looking and looking. And everybody said, well, what are you looking for? And then he just kept looking and looking. What are you looking for? What, are you, what is it? What is it? And then he said, I'm looking for one honest man. And then everybody gets, got pissed off at him because they are so intrigued by all this looking and questing. And then when it comes something that, right, and they're pissed off because they know he's right, because they're in the marketplace, and everybody's lying and cheating and stealing, right? But they don't want to know that. They don't want to pay attention to that, right? Now, that sounds sort of, yeah, that's kind of cool and courageous. Yeah, but Diogenes does other things that you might not find so cool or courageous. Well, they're courageous at least, but they're not, you don't find them cool. Diogenes also famously came into the center of the marketplace and masturbated in public. And most of, and we're, all, we're all going like, ew, ew, right? How are these two things possibly related? Well, here's how they're related, right? The group of people that start to take shape in this tradition are called the cynics. It's not our modern meaning of the word. So I'm going to use a capital C. 
because this just means, you know, being suspicious that everybody has an, uh, an ulterior motive or a secret agenda. That's not what is meant here. This means actually living like a dog, because Diogenes also famously lived outside of Athens in a barrel. So let me tell you one more story, and, we, and then we'll try to connect all of them. So Alexander, the future emperor of the world, on his ascendance into godhood, comes to visit Diogenes. So you can imagine, here's the whole, like, all of this entourage, and, er and here comes Alexander to visit Diogenes, and he comes up to Diogenes, and he says, um, I can give you, like, half of the world. What do you want? And all Diogenes says is, could you move a little to the left? You're blocking my sunlight. So why is he living in a barrel? Why is that, that his answer to Alexander? Why does he look for one honest man? Why does he masturbate in public? Like, what is going on? Well, the cynics had a particular understanding of the Hellenistic domicile. They had the idea that what causes us to suffer isn't what we set, is what we set our heart on. It's not just the particular that we set our heart on our life and we're afraid of losing it in death. We can set our heart on all kinds of things that ultimately will cause us to suffer. Why? Well, their idea is when we set our hearts on the wrong things, those things will fail us, and that's how we suffer. You can see some similarities to some aspects of Buddhism and to some of the asceticism uh, that the Buddha first practiced himself. So the cynics came to the conclusion that what the Hellenistic period was showing is that many of the things that we take for granted, and think about what that mean, word means, we take them as being part of the structure of reality, are actually not fundamentally real. They don't have staying power. They're not permanent. They're actually man-made. They are historically, culturally dependent, and they are temporary. And when we set ourselves on these things, the current of events can easily and readily wash them away, and then we are left bereft. Our hearts are torn from us, and that is how we experience domicide. Okay, so what should we do then? Well, you should learn, not just acquire a set of beliefs, Diogenes isn't just believing things, he's living in a certain place in a certain way. Right? You should learn how to set your heart on the kinds of things that are not man-made, are not contingent, that will not be swept away by events. Well, what are those kinds of things? Well, one are the laws of the natural world. So this is why this Diogenes lives in a barrel. He wants to live as much as he can like an animal, in one sense. In another sense, he doesn't want to live like an animal at all. But he wants to live as much by natural law as opposed to man-made law. He doesn't want to be invested in man-made cultural institutions or practices, cultural, political value systems, because those will end. And then if we have set our heart upon them, our hearts will be broken. So you want to, as much as you can, live according to the patterns of nature, because those are not man-made, and those will not disappear with the change in history or culture. Now, if it was just that, then of course Diogenes would just live like an animal. But the cynics also said, in addition to natural law, there are moral laws. There are moral laws as to what is a proper way to be a good human being. 
Now, in, now you, know, you may say, but isn't that all culturally relative? And of course, that's a big dispute. But one of the things that the cynics did was to try and make a distinction between moral principles that are culturally based, sorry, uh, moral principles that are not culturally based, and purity codes that are culturally historically based. And they are similar to each other in ways such that we can often confuse them together. So a good way of understanding this is in terms of more modern language of guilt versus shame. Now, again, we use these terms interchangeably, and uh, we shouldn't, because having a distinction between them is useful. Guilt is your distress at having realized you've broke, broken a moral principle. Shame is your distress at having violated a purity code. Let me give you an example. If, as I was delivering this video, there was some sort of malfunction in my clothing, and my clothing suddenly fell down. I would be deeply embarrassed. I would experience shame. Why? Because I violated a code, a cultural code, which is I'm supposed to be fully clothed in a public discourse, and I am. Right? But have, if that happened, have I done anything immoral? Most people would say, no, you didn't do anything immoral. You didn't do anything wrong. So I don't feel guilt. I feel shame. Sometimes they can be against each other, right? You may be made to feel ashamed even though you're doing something that you believe, let's say in a justified way, is morally right. Many people who supported blacks during the civil rights movement were subjected to terrific amounts of shaming, even though they didn't experience any guilt in what they were doing. See, purity codes are designed to keep the categorical boundaries that make a culture at a particular historical period run the way it's running. They are highly tied up with the invested power structures who are usually highly invested in keeping things running the way they're running. So we have lots of important boundaries that are protected by purity codes. So for example, just to give you one more example, just to make it clear. None of you, I hope, would be distressed by me doing the following. Here's some water. Is that okay? Imagine if I do the following. I collect lots of saliva in my mouth. Lots of it. Just tons and tons of saliva. And then <laughs> I spit it into the glass. <laughs> Until there's gobs and gobs of saliva in my glass. And now when I swirl it around, just imagine it, come on, and then I drink it. And now you're going, ooh. Now notice, if I mix the water inside my mouth and swallow, you're fine with that. But if the saliva comes outside of my mouth into the glass, you find it repellent. Okay? That's because there's an important purity code here. The purity code is, this is the boundary of John, and things inside this are John, and pieces of John should not come out into the world. John should not spit, John should not fart, John should not burp, John should not cut his fingernails off and leave them in front of you. John should even not leave his bed unmade because he's leaving his impression behind, and that's yucky. Okay, that's a purity code. Now, very often, we confuse purity codes with moral codes. We confuse purity codes because we confuse our disgust reaction that's often purity code based with a moral judgment that should be based on reasoning and evidence. Please listen to me very carefully with what I want to say. First of all, I'll give you something non-controversial. Both of my parents are dead, but suppose they were alive. I don't want to see them having sex. I don't. I would go, ooh, ah. Is that a moral argument? Of course not. There's nothing immoral with them having sex. That's why I'm here. In a similar way, and please hear what I'm saying, 
I might not want to see two men having sex. That doesn't mean that that is any way a moral judgment on my part. A lot of the ways we have persecuted gay people is because we have confused a purity code disgust reaction with a legitimate moral argument. The people who started the process and we're still pulling them apart today, right now, right here, right now, were the cynics. What Diogenes was trying to do was get you to pull apart the moral code from the purity code. He did nothing immoral by masturbating in public. But although lots of people were doing stuff that was culturally acceptable in the marketplace, most of it was immoral. Do you see? Alexander comes to him and offers him power and fame, but those are all the things the Stoics say are no good. Because, sorry, the Cynics say are no good because if you set your hearts on them, those are man-made, human-defined, and therefore your heart will eventually be broken. Set your heart on what won't get broken. So, the cynics developed this very powerful, provocative way of enacting Socrates and trying to get us, the cynics are trying to get us, to realize what we're setting our heart on and to pull apart our automatic disgust reactions from moral reflection on what we're doing. Now, Diogenes has a disciple, Crates, and then Crates has a disciple, Zeno. This is not the Zeno of Zeno's paradoxes. This is a different Zeno. Now, whereas the cynics tended to be sort of hostile to Plato because of his emphasis on argumentation, Zeno was deeply influenced by the cynics, but he also really liked Plato. He saw that there was value in the argumentation. And he realized that there's deep connections between your ability to rationally reflect and your ability to use your reason. So what he wanted to do was integrate the rational argumentation and reasoning of Plato with right, the provocative aspects of the cynics. So he crafted a way of life that put the two together. And then he would walk up and down a stoa this is a covered colonnade in Athens, teaching this new integration. That's where we get the name Stoic from. Stoic doesn't mean being, you know, stiff upper lip and tolerating the decline of the British Empire or, or stuff like that. It means something much more sophisticated. So Zeno's insight was there's something deeply right about the cynics, but they're getting something wrong, right? They're concentrating too much on the product and not enough on the process. Right? They're concentrating too much on what we're attaching our heart to rather than the very process of attachment itself. Because the Stoics said, yes, particular cultures and history are variable, but being social isn't. Human beings are inherently social. Yes, particular political, cultural, and historical institutions and traditions are variable, but it is part of our humanity to be social. We shouldn't be leaving the polis. Because notice that Diogenes and Socrates have to actually enter the polis to practice their philosophy. So, Zeno said, it's not what you set your heart on, it's how you set your heart. And this is always a hallmark of rationality. One of the crucial, and this is like even recent work on rationality, Keith Stanovich, and I, the hallmark of rationality is learning not to focus just on the products of your cognition, but find valuable and pay attention to the processes. What process 
what is this process of setting your heart on? All right. Well, it's something we've already talked about. It's this process of co-identification. It's the process by which the agent arena relationship is set up. It's the process by which you're simultaneously assuming an identity and assigning an identity. And you're doing that all the time, unconsciously. Now, the Stoics say, ah, that process of co-identification is where your identity is being formed. That's where your agency is taking shape. But if you mindlessly co-identify, if you do it automatically and reactively, you will, if you'll allow me the acronym, you'll mar that whole process. It'll be open to all kinds of distortion, self-deception, self-destruction. You can see here again the axial age ideas. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to pay attention to this process. We need to pay attention to how we're assuming and assigning identities. We need to do it in such a way that we can strengthen our agency in the face of the threat of domicide. So what I want to explore with you next time is what did the Stoics actually advocate as practices and how are these currently being taken up in our own psychotherapeutic endeavors to deal with our own version of domicide and the meaning crisis. Thank you very much for your time and attention. All right, guys, we're going to take eight minutes um, to just take a break. And um, I'd like you to join the video discussion now. You can do that by going to futurethinkers.org slash discuss, and then I'll let you in uh, once the timer is finished. And in, in the intermission, if you can think of questions or, or insights from watching this episode, that would be really great. Um, and then we can bring that up and take turns kind of discussing it um, during the discussion time. So we'll see you in eight minutes.
Check, check, check. Everyone hear me? Sounds good. Cool. Um, Yuvi mentioned that this one is kind of setting up for something important in the next one, which I think is true, but we haven't, this is as far as both of us have gone now. Um, yeah, it's, it's the last bit. Can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. um, it's the last point where he says that the cynics got what they got wrong was that they focused on the product of cognition, like what to attach their identity to rather than the process. Yeah, I actually fell asleep halfway through, but I <laughs> read Yuvi's notes. I'm not going to start off the discussion here, so if anyone else wants to. Sure, I can start off with just that point. Um, sure. We're not live yet, are we? We are, yeah. Oh, we are, okay. Yeah, I think that's a an interesting jump off point that we can maybe work backwards from. Unless somebody else has something that stood out to them. Go for it. Yeah, I, I, there's something I agree about that. There, there is. Um, there's also this one seemed to be a challenge. I also kind of zoned a bit there. Um, it was, it was, um, I don't remember this one being so hard the last time I listened to it, but I, I don't. This is the first one that, that that I've gone through where at the end of it I wasn't finding. Oh my god, that was great. Um, there's something in it that feels like. Um, did you want to say something about that, Mike? I was just going to say that the notes uh, really helped reading through the notes again. Yeah. 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 I, I agree. Um, there's something that, you know, I, I uh, commented at the end of the thread there on the, on the YouTube that um, this something, the distinction between the opponent processing and the, and the parasitic processing seems to be related to the focusing on product versus process or, you know, vice versa. Um, that the, there's something in the, um, it's interesting to think about um, Diogenes, what he's trying to do with um, focusing on distinguishing the purity codes from the moral codes um, and part of that. There's also something that, you know, he said very early on that, um, that also kind of set this in a, in a, and the strange thing, you know, when he when he was talking very early in the in the thing about that, when we this is the what Patrick you said the what be a good T-shirt when <laughs> if there is what did he say if the if I'm around then there's you know if the self is here then there's uh death then death yeah. is not and if death is here then I'm not right so there's something in the interesting in that I I. I, I resist that notion a little bit that the that I don't survive death to some extent, and I'm, and I'm curious about my own uh, my own um, hesitancy there. I don't, you know, I, I agree in a way, and I don't agree in a way, and I think that um, I, th I think my own personal sense is that it's not me personally that survives, but there's something deeper that I feel is happening that is um, evolving over time, um, which is the whole self is becoming more nuanced. Th this is something that seems to be r lately been a, a, an element that a lot of people are talking about. Um, it's not my personal identity that survives, but somehow consciousness overall that deepens um, with each iteration, the, the kind of something that's going out. Um, and it seems to be part of the confusion, you know, when I hear people talking about consciousness, it, it, so much of the confusion is around um, whether it's individual human consciousness, my personal consciousness, or whether it's awareness and the abstract. And it, so it's a very interesting kind of a thing that we get confused about. But um, there's something in this that also feels like that's true in that confusion between purity codes and moral codes. And it's it's nuanced. It's like a, there's something that feels like a, there's a challenge in actually trying to fully be aware of that. Um, and the the notion of the notion of Diogenes going through the marketplace with the with the lamp, looking for one honest person, you know, which is kind of a, like he said that 
that part that's really fascinating there is um, people are disgusted by the purity code, which is nothing morally wrong with that, but they're not disgusted by the moral, moral failings that are everywhere. And we're kind of blinding ourselves to saying, no, this moral stuff is just, that's just the standard way. That's how people behave. It's like, that's a problem. Um, and it's, and it's a strange, it's a strange kind of a thing because there's something of the way that Diogenes acts that on my, on the surface of it, the way that he talks about, he wants to live like an animal does in one sense. Um, I have kind of a repulsion to, and, and I think it's the something akin to the purity code kind of revulsion. I want to be more elevated and there, and there's something, um, dishonest about the way that I want to be elevated. Um, that I think he's pointing to, which is like a fascinating, it's a very subtle thing. It almost makes me want to cry how, how confused I am in that and, and makes me wonder if that's part of where we are in the meaning crisis right now. Something like, like um, I don't know, I'm curious. That's, that, that's the piece that stands out most starkly to me out of this discussion. This is interesting because when I was listening to that bit about the difference between violating moral codes and purity codes, um, to me, they, they don't seem to be different categorically. They seem to be different in terms of content. So, you know, uh, we, we have purity codes and that's part of one sort of sense-making system in the body. And we have moral codes and that's part of a different sense-making system in the body but they're just different sense-making systems in the body. Like, I don't think that they're categorically different. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I mean, the, the, whole, the whole thing with disgust to me seems to be about avoiding sickness. Like yeah. what I, like John shouldn't go out into the world. John should be contained. I like that part, that was funny. <laughs> But it's like, to me, the whole idea of disgust is to prevent sickness, unless I'm mistaken. And that's why we don't have the same response to moral, the breaking of moral codes. is because we're, no, we're not at risk of disease from that. We're <coughs> at risk of social disease, potentially, but we have a different reaction to that. Much more visceral when it's at the level of bodily harm. I was kind of surprised he didn't bring that up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, that's what I meant. Like, they're, they're <clears throat> these two reactions are meant to protect the different systems. Like, the disgust reaction is meant to protect kind of a uh, physical well being system, and the moral repulsion or lack of repulsion um, is meant to protect our social fabric, maybe. And, you know, it's interesting, um, and he also starts off at the beginning of it talking about philosophers are the physicians of the soul. So in some sense, morality is an illness of the soul, whereas the, the, the purity codes are, are re respond to illness of the body. Or, yeah, or, yeah, or yeah that's a good way like to that. put that. Yeah. yeah. Um, backing up to the, the death and identity thing, um, there is something in the, um, how do I phrase this? I can't exactly think of what exactly that you said, David, that I wanted to respond to, but it brought up something in my mind. So I'll just go through, ahead and say it. I used to go to Sunday school and my grandmother took me a couple of times. And I remember uh, this discussion about death emerging and what happens after. And, and there were certain people that, that were just adamantly about like the brain Consciousness is in the brain. If the brain dies, there's nothing after. And and then the whole, like, I think around that time, I was thinking it was Lion King when that movie came out because I think uh, Mufasa was consoling Simba about or talking about the circle of life. And they said, when we die, like, don't worry. When we die, our bodies become the grass and the, granite, the antelope eat the grass. And it's this whole circle of life. And it's supposed to give this feeling, at least that's the way... When I was watching with other people, that's the feeling I think was received in the group that that life continues on. But to me, it just seemed kind of like disappointing if we don't continue on with our memories. And, and to me, the identity was about memories, what you take with you. If you just reset today and lose all your memories, 
you're basically a different person altogether. So it's not you're it's not a continuation of you. It's only a continuation of consciousness. But then later on, I had lots of experiences through meditation of just total bliss without memory or without self, without identity and recognizing that all that stuff is just like a mask, all that stuff, the, the, the memories and the identity stuff. It's just something I wear with me and that's totally fine to die when I die um, as long as there is deeper awareness. And then so when he was saying consciousness only exists in the brain, that kind of I wanted to challenge that idea in my own mind. Like, what is it about consciousness that is just limited to this, th these two little windows and this window and this window? Like, w what is it about consciousness that that so many people are so certain is biologically based? And so I was trying to do an experiment of like, is consciousness, because my idea of, of like a greater reality of, of like life after death would have to be rooted in some sort of quantum physics, higher dimensional thing. Like, and, and that's what the whole Large Hadron Collider is trying to figure out. Are there higher dimensions that particles are moving in and out of? And so me, if we were to figure out if there's life after death, that would be the basis to locate it. Are there other dimensions that our consciousness are also occupying in addition to this one? And when we die in this dimension, are we continuing on in other dimensions? Anyway, it's just an, kind of an anecdote. I don't have a point after this. That was definitely a part of the lecture that stopped me up as well. I was like, huh, that's... Such certainty, you know? Sure. Yeah, he sounds quite sure about something that I'm not sure we can be sure of. And... Um, the other thing that always, since, since his lecture about uh, dynamical systems and life and circular logic, uh, it clicked for me, if, if that is how life works, right? The tree generates the leaves, the leaves generate the tree. The idea that consciousness comes from matter or matter comes from consciousness is not the way to look at it. It's probably that consciousness comes from matter and matter comes from consciousness. And it's a dynamical system that operates in a circular logic that we resist understanding and try to pin down into some kind of linear relationship, which doesn't exist, is my guess. You just described biocentrism. That's the idea that we are the source, the consciousness is the source of matter and reality, and we project what we see out into the world, that it doesn't exist empirically without consciousness there to w witness it, which is, right. is being Except, kind of I mean, experimented and played with in different f uh, physics experiments, like the double slit experiment. It has huge implications for this idea that we affect with nothing more than observation. It's really fascinating. I think actually biocentrism, there's a book by the same title, I forget the, t the author, but that's kind of one of the central themes. Is that like the opposite of kind of the materialistic consciousness comes from matter? Is that what biocentrism yeah. is? Yeah. 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 So I'm saying it's both. Mm. Consciousness comes from matter. Matter comes from consciousness. I don't know, but this mm. seems the most likely to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. It, yeah. It's like a, uh, it's a, it, it was a real like prick up my ears moment in the lecture for sure. That. Mm -hmm. Certainty, yeah. I, I thought back to all my experiences with psychedelics and meditation wondering like is there have I ever experienced higher dimensional states of consciousness like outside of time or outside of what I perceive to be three-dimensional matter and the answer is yes in a lot of ways and so it made me wonder I mean it, is consciousness a phenomenon only existing in our three-dimensional space and materialistic space and, and I mean you can't it's nothing provable but it's interesting it reminds of me it. of some points in that book a case against reality I've only uh, listened to kind of some parts at the beginning but um, some interesting points there that uh, basically <laughs> the quote-unquote reality is is a construct and there's kind of no way of knowing what actual reality looks like. We can only perceive the sort of the interface version, the user interface. 
Did you finish that book, David? Uh, which book? I was, um, which one? The Case Against Reality. Case Against Reality. Yeah, yeah, I did. In fact, I was uh, I was just thinking, you know, I was I was trying to look up the the link to the uh, biocentrism talk that I saw somebody somebody give a give a talk at the biocentrism uh, on biocentrism um, a couple of years ago, about five years ago, maybe on at um, the Science and Non Duality Conference. Yeah. Um, and somebody just posted it recently, so I watched it this morning, and it that along with the case against reality seems seems tightly integrated. You know, where consciousness is primary, and and matter kind of arises out of that. But that, but I like that there's something very reciprocal there. That um, mm -hmm. it's hard to say. I mean, in in a way. That, so yes, I, I'm sorry. And this is part of the part of the questions. So I'm I'm gonna. I, I can pause to make my comment in a minute, but it, or kind of extend it here if, it was, if we were in the middle of something. Well, we were just discussing because I I've, I had actually take I was listening to the audiobook version, so I took it back because there's too many references to a PDF that I couldn't download through Audible, so I just said screw it and got rid of the book. But I figured you'd finished it and maybe have more comments about it that are relevant to this discussion. I I. I like it a lot, um, and, a, and it's a very it's a very intriguing and, and provocative um, perspective. Um, I think that there are a couple of places where uh, Donald Hoffman gets says some things that rattle me in a way that I have to kind of think about. Um, but mostly, he says stuff in a way that makes me think um, it is a clearer sense of it like a lot of the, a lot of the thing a lot of the contradictions that we have by thinking that consciousness arises out of matter that that the brain produces consciousness or something um is is wrong that the the brain is an instrument that and and it's interesting having listened to the biocentrism talk this morning there's a part of this which feels like it's my my thinking has shifted a little bit so it's, i'm not sure how purely i'm remembering the uh donald hoffman case against reality part but, but something like, um, oh, and actually there's another person posting about this, this idea as well, and thinking that the body and the brain somehow, um, the body is an extension of my consciousness into physical form. The brain is a specific part where consciousness flows through and, um, and consciousness is a larger, the whole environment of the universe and consciousness, all, all of that stuff that's happening. Um, is coming through this this instrument in part in a constrained way. It's something like, um, as I was thinking about that, something like the Big Bang is something like a, a growing organism that has a similar um, a similar you know and it's analogical to the to a biological organism growing right. Mm. That matter in physics is is blossoming in this way that um, creates more figure and ground the more that it grows the more figure and ground that it goes the more the consciousness grows and expands by creating you know in a sense sort of fractally keep growing this this crystalline form that has that's doing both at the same time and life is a, a, an experience of the expression of that so it's like the whole thing is living um and and it has these two kind of opponent densities that that build on top of each other, something like that. Seems to be a different way of saying what Heather was saying as well, that uh, consciousness and matter kind of build upon each other. It's, it's a um, chicken and an egg thing. You, it's hard to say which one came first. Yeah. It kind of relates to how I've con conceptualized in my own mind the idea of duality and non-duality. Like it seems to me that for consciousness to exist and perceive itself instead of it just being a singularity or some, I don't know, whatever there was before the Big Bang, Big Bang that it needs duality for self-reflection. This is getting way into <laughs> some other land, but... Yeah. Maybe we can get a little bit back to the subject of this video. <laughs> yeah. You know what I thought was interesting about the video so far actually was um, how there was this kind of crisis of anxiety and then the Stoics 
came out as a response and it seems like a complete recreation of that cycle um to relieve suffering yeah i thought that was pretty interesting pretty similar to today patrick you were trying to say something yes <laughs> it's, it's fine. But, uh, what surprised me here is that uh, I, I don't think we maybe knew it but we are here because of epicurus and his that focus on the things that give meaning we know yes uh but but he said meaning is friendship in a broad sense in and in, in philosophical friendships and that's what we are doing now so thank you friend and i've been thinking a lot about the the stoicism porn that's been going on for years now and I'm, I've, I've read it and tried to apply it and, 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 and think that this is so important. I need to read something every day and it's, it's non-attachments and it's not. But now suddenly John gave me the context. It's like, this is the ground of modern therapy. And, and then a whole other level kicked in for me at least. It's like, aha, now I see, okay. So, so now, now I, I haven't thought, I, I watched this episode last uh, day, so I'm still thinking about it. But, but that was a big eye-opening for me because Stoicism has been you know, so heavily talked about and written about the last years that you shouldn't really care, you know, just so stand above everything. And it's, it's hard to do. But, but now, this, both, both the philosophical friendship that we are urging for and um uh, domicide uh, you know f f i think we all can all relate to feeling a loss of home that we don't really belong anywhere so and, and that was also a very valuable context for me today mm. it's kind of sad but 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 it, it's you know a place to start yeah what was the light bulb moment that you described when you realized stoicism is kind of the foundation of modern therapy when he said it <laughs> no i mean what was your yeah. what no, was no, it no, but, but, but it, it's been like okay the, uh, all these wise men who, who, who fought wars thousands of years ago and and, and it's, you know like i said stand above it and everything but 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 when when he kind of said it okay this is because I, i've been in therapy who hasn't I, and 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 then when i i, I read like Jung and even ah, not maybe Schopenhauer, he's kind of special. But, uh, but 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 the modern ways of looking at how to to uh, handle your your psyche and your relationship to the world, and and that also brings the. I mean, in in, in a few discussions ago, he, he talked about mindf mindfulness, and it's a big corporate movement now, and and you can't understand and define, and it's like. Oh, you should just release the world and, and not pay attention to. It. And it's like so hard to grasp and everything, um, and that's heavily connected now to the stoicism too. Um, but it's kind of hard. But now I'm I'm trying. I'm still. I hope it's an upward spiral <laughs> that I'm in, but because I, I'm connecting things that I haven't connected before. Mm. So that's what I can say now. Mm. Okay. Hi guys, may I, may I try and join in? This is quite a difficult uh, uh, episode to join in on. The last I've been catching up the last uh, few, and they've been very exciting, um, and I've been quite excited to sort of get back back into it and back into the group. Um, so, so trying to not bring up previous episodes and kind of sticking with what with what's being discussed at the moment. My, my feeling um, around this episode and what stands out a lot for me is, is kind of um, you know, trying to see how one can rebuild an identity for yourself, sort of on the, on the manifest side of the street, in the, on the side of sort of more like scientific style consciousness. Um, it's, it's, you know, I'm, I'm trying to identify um, these the various um, mechanics of, of you know, the machinery of self that John has been talking about quite a bit. And in the previous episodes, you know, this sort of spiraling up process of, of rebuilding a, 
sense of self that works with the world has got to, it, 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 you know, if it's based in, an ex, in a meditative experience or a meditative practice that gets you in touch with that, like ever present self that is so often revealed in a psychedelic experience or through a lot of meditative practice. Um, to me, that's, you know, when, when John brings up death, you know, it's, if your identity is, is quite strongly anchored in an egoic sense of material world self and, uh, and not at all based in that sort of ever present experience in meditation, then death is complete and utter. But if there are degrees of an identity that's rooted in the sense of being, like the being mode and that sense of ever presentness that can laugh at all the change that's happening, then death is also just another you don't, you don't know what you really are when you take off the sort of physical meat suit, but you've got a sense of it, like that sense yeah. of that. It's a different identity to the sort of ego physical self. And so that's this episode has thrown me quite a bit in the discussion of death and a sort of an, an not really an acknowledgement of that that it, eternal self that's witnessed in meditation or witnessed in psychedelic states or higher states. It's so obvious in, high, in these really high states, you know, that this yeah. ever-present self is so profound that it just annihilates this egoic material plane. Not annihilates it, but it kind of smiles deeply. <laughs> So I, I didn't know how to jump in and, and kind of get back into it. So I thought I'd just um, kind of throw that into it. I think that's a good note to jump in on. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, I, I was reminded of Stephen Covey. He's a business writer, but he, in one of the books, he, he said, we, all humans want to live, love, and leave a legacy. And leaving a legacy is, what I think, what you talk about now, Alexander. Uh, and And... One is leaving your ego behind and, and feeling that you have done something important. It's like this, having ph philosophical friendships, I think, to, 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 to you know, leave, leave your ideas and, and everything you do over also to others. But I can also relate it to, to my father is an, an artist, has been all his life, uh, illustrator and everything. And his way of leaving a legacy is very physical. It's like the, the paintings I have in all... <laughs> On my house, and, and that's one percent of of them. So, so, so we all desperately kind of want to leave a legacy and, and a, a mark on the world in in some way. And and um, so that was my reflection. So I'm I'm glad you brought it up because I don't know how, how I will leave a legacy, other than I have kids. That's why I run around and you know <laughs> every single Monday when. I'm, I take care of. So, but but I, I think there are many ways of leaving a legacy and, and leaving your ego behind. Like you, you can people can still remember you, maybe not directly, but indirectly in a few generations. It is. This is this is again one of the things that I think was challenging about this this lecture. Um, there's something in me that wonders if that the desire and drive to leave a legacy is not an egoic in a way that's not not useful or it's and i and i i'm, I'm really mixed on this and it seems related to the other point that that came to mind as i was listening to it when when he mentions that um diogenes is also trying to get us he doesn't want to be attached to culture right he doesn't want to be um reliant on culture he, he's when you know it's kind of that why he has the response that he does to alexander you know um, like I, i'm not going to pay attention to the to the cultural aspects of this and it's it's a it's 
it's challenging for me to think about what what exactly that is is that there's something that values what culture brings without being attached to the culture i agree to that but i don't want to eschew culture too much there's something of the way that diogenes approaches it which seems chastising right it seems like his provocative nature seems like a wagging his finger in the face of everyone and say you're doing it the wrong way um and yeah there's some value to that but there's also something of the it's necessary to go through that part of the cycle um and then and then drop it later like it's um i don't i think you need the ego development at some point and then drop it at some point um and there's something of wanting to leave a legacy that um, if I continue to want to leave a legacy at the end of my life, it seems like I'm, again, valuing too much the product rather than the process. And even if the legacy is like Buddha or Christ or you know, Jesus or anything, it's like, remember my name. And I said, no, 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 I want you to remember the teaching. Whether you remember me or not is irrelevant. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a, it's an interesting notion, um, complex to kind of, I feel, I feel most uneasy in that contemplation. I feel kind of in between. I can't quite decide um, if I like it or not. I, I feel almost nauseous in actually thinking about it. I, I think a big part of this is the sponsoring thought of what you are attempting to do. Like, are, are you, is the legacy a reflection of leaving behind the end product of your work? Or is it about what is left when you just focus your life on your work? And in some ways, it's kind of like when you listen to a musical artist making music for other people to listen to or for themselves. It's always the best albums when the artist is making the music for themselves. Everything else is kind of formulaic and I don't know. You can see it's not, the passion isn't there. I think the same thing kind of happens in this way. Like how a true legacy isn't really as strong if it's only there for the sake of legacy. Is that at all what the source of disgust is for you? Because I think that it is for me. I think so. Something like that. It, it, the, the thought that comes to mind there is um, trying to extend copyright law or intellectual property law in and, and the way that not only am I, I have this body of work, but I'm protecting it as mine. You have to, if you're going to, um, if you're going to reference this, then you have to, you have to honor that I'm the one who created it, um, which is, that I think is, is, I think there's something closer to, to the sense of disgust there. It, it is interesting as well, because I think I, there's another aspect of this, which I think is kind of like um, coral reefs in a way, right? Coral reefs create um, a platform on which complexification can happen. And the bodies of work that we have, the art that we have, creates a kind of a cultural platform from which we can continue to develop and deepen our awareness. So that's something like, I like that as a starting point, you know, getting to the point of, imbibing kind of kind of consuming the cultural frame the the pattern to to awaken in me what is uniquely mine to contribute to the pattern um so in that way it it continues on but not a fixation on trying to hold mine as distinct from you know what let me see if i can draw the boundary around what specifically i contributed to this whole um and instead just allow the thing to blossom yeah and Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. I have something else. Um, yeah, what I was thinking is kind of something related is that this, you know, uh, like uh, culture is not your friend or trying to eliminate culture or detach from culture. I think that's it's kind of a silly thing to do because um, people often assume that they're somehow separate hey. from culture, but we're not. And this is something that was talked about in some of the earlier lectures that there are these layers of psychotechnologies that have been developed through uh, different periods in human history that are not natural to us. And we take them for granted, for example, language or our ability to think in numbers. 
um, and those are part of culture. So uh, we take for granted this this kind of all these layers in this background that gives us context. Yeah, but I, I've I know the Terence McKenna lectures where he mentions culture is not your friend. I I think he's making a distinction between culture and psychotechnology, which I think a lot of what you described is psychotechnology. I think culture, culture from the Terence McKenna viewpoint is this artificially replicated baggage that is more like ritual or tradition that where the original meaning is lost and we just pass it on because that's the way we've always done it. I think the way that's how it's being described. But I don't think you can have one without the other. It's like if, if you're, I don't know, maybe this is a bad metaphor, but if you're like making soup and, and you just want to pick out one of the ingredients, yeah, okay, it doesn't, never mind, that metaphor doesn't work. It seems like Alex has got a lot to contribute to this in the background. Yeah, he does. Um, something like you can't take the ingredient out of the soup. Never mind. <laughs> I mean, Feels like this, a baby bathwater metaphor. Yeah. Needed, I think. <laughs> this reminds me of, of my favorite book, uh, The Brothers Karamazov, and all of Dostoevsky's work. That that it's it's that there's simply no way of approaching it without approaching the deep cultural context he was in when writing it. And I, I've, I've I've read studies of how he, he wrote his book. You know this. In, oh, it's genius five volumes of you I, I would never get through them but I <laughs> uh, so I've read and and, and, in, in, and I think that's because I think Heather you you work with with art is that correct yes so and and, and my father is an artist and I, I I deeply appreciate like Dostoevsky and others that they break the boundaries and they they, are, they, they can be deeply 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 embedded in their cultural context and but still they see something else so it's not either or yeah there's maybe something around uh again it's maybe what the stoics are pointing to about the the nature of attachment or the process it's how it's how you hold your relationship with the culture maybe that is important yeah, it's the agent and arena that Verveke talks about. That well, they're they're in relationship with each other. It's a feedback cycle, and you can't really separate one from the other. They feed each other. There is. I, I've had a couple couple of conversations with a friend who um, we started talking a little bit more about um, the system one and system two thinking, thinking fast and slow from. Um, um, I'm not remembering his name right now. Kahneman. But, yeah, yeah, Kahneman. Um, and, and there's something of development. It seems like culture and the, the, that stuff that feeds us is an attempt to build up system one thinking, right? The habitual thinking that allows us to operate. The, this, the, it, we build habit um, through attachment to process, to, to not only process, but product too, and then get to a point where it no longer fulfills us or nurtures us and we need to extend beyond it. And, and so we have to break out, break down from that in order to get to a deeper sense of system too. And this also feels like um, at the cultural level, on the individual level it happens, this is where I think it's interesting, the, the um, inside out reference, where the falling down of the of the islands of personality when going through that that moment is a kind of domicide, right? It's an internal domicide of this is everything familiar has to be torn down in order to make room for the new me that I'm becoming. Like the old me is now constraining in a way that's blocking me from being fully realized. Um, and at a cultural level, it's kind of the same thing. We go through a, a deeper um, thing and why it seems that the axial age and this age are, are similar. You know, we're in an age of anxiety. You know, when you mentioned earlier, Patrick, in the, in the comment thread on the YouTube that we're still in the age of anxiety, it's like, I almost commented that we're in there again. Yes, it's been still kind of all the way through, but it's kind of at an intense, an intense um, uh, you know, 
crescendo at the moment. Um, like we're the meaning crisis is like really at high pitch right now with this sense of what is all of this about? Who am I? And, and uh, I was even thinking a little bit about some of the, you know, some of the wonders that may be possible with the things that we're developing. Um, you know, the, as uh, several of the people here and, and Mike and UV, you've talked a lot about game B, the potential that we may be able to outgrow game A and move into something more beautifully expressive of our, of our nature. And at the same time that all of this is happening, I'm worried about things like, I don't know if you guys have seen the Clearview AI, that, that there's a story out about face recognition that is now available to police officers and, um, and um, agents and stuff that you can just take a picture of somebody and it will automatically look up their whole social network and social graph and tell you, um, it, can, it can instantly identify anybody just by a photograph. It's by, by scraping 3 billion photos off of Instagram and Facebook, it's able to, it's a very deeply progressive, uh, you know, deeply, um, deeply um, effective face recognition software that, that you, can, you, can, you can, without very much difficulty at all, just take a picture of anybody on the street, know who they are, what they've said, where they live, what, they, what their bank account is, all of this stuff. And it's like, holy moly, it's like we are moving way too fast. Um, our ability to know what is ethical and safe and moral and all of that, it's like we, you know, it's, we're, we're just at the edge of it. So again, I think that maybe, I may be coming into the conversation today already with a little bit of um, existential nausea about just how fast we're moving um, and, and wanting a little bit of stability, a little bit of domicide of myself going through all of this. You know, this, the, the change that we're going through in our society is like an increase, a, a persistent increase in frequency where the age of anxiety that we that was noted in in this lecture was like noting the the difference between a single peak and valley of a of a wave whereas and that was difficult that was that was an adjust adjustment you no longer had a home because you came from the peak and now we're in the valley of of the wave of change but now it's like that stuff is happening we don't have time to adjust to anything because it's happening so fast now and i think that's both an exciting and scary thing it's scary in the ways that you just mentioned but it's exciting in the way that it actually there's no getting used to anything anymore that you you can only get used to the idea of change which is basically like you're getting used to being in process instead of state and that to me is very exciting about a kind of human civilizational change all of a sudden we can't rely on state we can't rely on anything we just have to be in the body here and now and, and get used to that constant flux. Being, like I've said many times before, strapped to the hood of the car. It just seems like if we can get used to that constant change and get comfortable in it or get comfortable in free fall, like I brought up before, um, we have such an opportunity. I don't know. I have no basis for this, I, for for an idea that this is how we could grow into a game B society. But I just have a feeling about it. But maybe that's something uh, yeah, we could look for one, evidence one, for. Yeah, one one thing that we are bringing up all the time, and, and John is bringing up, is and going back to what you said now, David, is is the loss of agency. Uh, and and. and like you said now, the, the face scraping and, and it's like like it, someone else is is you know governing your life and they, but but luckily what people share on Facebook and Instagram and stuff is often superficial shit, like they're just <laughs> projecting that my life is good now even though it's not, and that's okay. But but you know so 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 right now even if 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 they. They, they will come up with a totally wrong persona in the 90% of, of cases, I think, if they, that's what they go for. But, but it, it's scary, yes. Uh, uh, but uh, may, uh, maybe it has potential, no. Uh, but I, I think the loss of uh, uh, agency ha has been a recurring theme that has made me think again, that, that may, maybe that's, because they talk about it, about addiction, they talk about it in, in, in so many ways that when you lose your agency, then what? Then 
that's when the downward spiral mm. starts. You know, it's just so interesting how this relates to this this detachment from the ego identity because the the identity is latched onto something kind of static. When the world changes, it's this is the, this is who I am. This is who I want to be, and I experience pain when I go up against reality, and reality demands that I be something else in order to survive. Um, it's one of the reasons I like those Jed McKenna books so much is it's asking that we just discard that identity altogether. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to say, um, Patrick, that the thing that is, uh, just, just to clarify something about the Clearview AI that's, that's troubling is not so much what the image they get of you because they're looking at your social media, but just the fact that I can take your photo, submit it to this, and identify you. Like, I don't need your name or anything else. I can find your name. So, and they said, if this gets into the wrong hands, it, you, you know, imagine um, somebody who is, um, who, is, who, who is a criminal who has access to this technology um, and is watching people get on planes, you know, go to the airport and take off. Oh, I now know, okay, look you up. I know you're gone. I know you're going to be out of town. So let me go rob your house while you're, it's like, I, just the degree to which um, we are transparent to some to, to some actors without knowing how transparent we are and an asymmetric transparency um, that's that's a part of the erosion of the sense of who I am that, um, that that's a part of losing agency losing agency over the ability to reveal anything about my identity and that it is it is um, the sense of privacy kind of kind of erodes in a way that um, that is, yeah. again, the asymmetry of it seems to be the thing that challenges me the most. And that goes back to the marketplace that he, he um, uh, visited with the lamp and everything. That, that I, I think that, that that's always a counter movement to everything. So, so it's like all these strange technologies that can, you know, reveal who you are and where you are. And, and that there's a whole counter movement also in the market, it's the same marketplace and they charge you also but to protect your privacy and everything. So it's a very strange, and, and I, I would like to go out in the market and, and also shine a light and, and say, you know, <laughs> who's the honest one here? Um, but yeah, it, it, yeah, it's complex, but, but, it, but, it, but still, it, it's still like the guilt versus shame that when, when you break purity codes, uh, uh, that's one thing, and, and we, we can all say boohoo to that, and it's uh, disgusting. And we still do that when, when artists break the boundaries of anything. But but then we don't feel guilt when when you know the, the marketplace is just taking all your money and, and laughing and <laughs> and leaving you, you know, behind. So 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 I need to think more about it. You you hear that too now. But it, it's th this this was a strange episode. Open so many doors. <laughs> I will see if I can close some of them during the week, <laughs> coming week, because this was, yeah. Hmm. I wonder about if um, the threat to moral codes, like through what you're talking about, Patrick, this sort of uh, lack of any kind of morality or ethics in vast areas of the marketplace if that has some influence on people's um pure people oh, people then become over focused on purity codes like i'm just curious if that because because we can mix them up whether distress over a lack of morality then can cause some people to overfocus on uh, like, you know, family values and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's much easier to portray in some, portray in some way. But it, you, I, I do not break purity codes. It's like, oh, my life is so fine. Yeah. <laughs> but then underneath the surface, maybe you're breaking so many so many other more principles. I don't know, but I've seen that happen. You know, when when you think 
the lives of, of, of people around you, and they are, it, it's perfect. They are following all the purity codes. But then you hear these strange stories and see families uh, just disappear. And it's like, hmm, yeah. So, so Instagram and Facebook and everything, it's, it's, I think it's very good for purity codes. People don't want to listen to moral principles, I guess, too much there. <laughs> It also seems to me too that a lot of uh, the scandals, or this is sort of going off on a tangent, but it's just interesting. A lot of the scandals around um, like really kind of high level Buddhist teachers are, which come out as these kind of moral scandals, like they're, you know, whatever, whatever, usually they're sex scandals. And usually there's nothing technically immoral about the behavior. It's just that it's violated a purity code. And okay, so maybe there's some lying, which we can say is immoral, but a lot of it is the purity code violations rather than morality violations that are at the center of those of those scandals. Yeah, I, I see that for sure. Like there is, what was that documentary on Osho? Oh yeah, Wild Wild Country. Wild, wild country. Yeah, there were a number of scenes there where it seemed like the filmmakers were making it seem like something else was happening that wasn't. Like there was what seemed to be some sort of orgy or or something satanic happening when it looked kind of like like it would be on on sort of a more raucous version of ayahuasca sessions I've already seen happen or or like uh, it was like shadow work or something where someone could like be acting out a, a repressed version of themselves and, and going nuts within the room. And that's kind of a safe space to do that if they're doing that kind of work, but it could, it, you know, shown in video, it seemed like this very disgusting display of something just really wrong happening in that place. Yeah. Yeah, that seems like a very extreme version of um, possible confusion between purity code and moral code, right? Yeah. Um. There's something else I was thinking about, too, and I can't remember now. I, I, I'm glad that we're having this discussion. Oh, I know, I was gonna, um, it, two related notions, things outside of this talk that, that cast a specific light, kind of a kind of light on it. One of them is the, um, I'm in, still reading the Ian, the Goldcrist book, um, The Master and His Emissary. Very interesting looking at uh, right brain, left brain specialization and the, from the, seeing the whole, right brain seeing the whole and left brain seeing parts that makes me think there's something related to that in all of this, the, the, the wanting to hold on, you know, seems like the left brain is the one that gets so attached to certainty and so attached to parts and so attached to, um, you know, the, the product rather than the process. Um, and then that can happen on an individual level or a cultural level. Um, so that's one thing that, that comes to mind and, and kind of flavors us. The other one is, I don't know um, who else is aware of this, but the, um, there's a face, I mean, a, um, a Netflix series out now, or that's been out for a while, called um, The Good Place, which um, I, was, I was watching as a, a guilty pleasure for that. I watched the first season and felt embarrassed that I was watching it and liked it as much. <laughs> Second season, um, it really kind of did a head trip on me in that it, goes, it takes a twist that goes in a very different direction. And looks at morality in a very morality and ethics in a very interesting perspective, um, and it it is a it's kind of it, I think this is another part of the of for me a kind of an existential disgust or existential kind of nausea of looking at at myself of the places where I want safety and noticing the way in which I am deceiving myself that the way that I'm living is okay. Um, it's like, oh, it's like suddenly, um, it feels like, hmm, yeah, this is kind of interesting. It feels like the purity code that he discusses, he, he discusses, discusses in the, the lecture about spitting into the cup and drinking it, how that's, that's repugnant. Um, suddenly, 
there are moral decisions or or life decisions that I'm making that don't even have to do with that kind of external and internal, but more and more internal to internal processing that is discussing me violating my own boundaries within myself with choices about dietary choices or, or exercise choices or other things where it's like I something has shifted where what used to be acceptable to me suddenly is no longer acceptable. Um, so the, the, the line, the membrane of the purity code shifts in a way that's like, oh my God, <laughs> how did that happen? How did I end up on the wrong end of the you know, wrong end of who, who I think I am? Which is, it's interesting because he talks about purity codes to a large extent with his example of like, okay, who here's the border of John and what's inside John shouldn't come out. And I, and it just strikes me that what you're talking about, it almost seems relevant that that happens as the border, the border of yourself perceived self expands, that that changes what's what has to be it changes the the idea about what what is right within the membrane right like if my membrane is just myself then there's one set of purity codes one set of morals but if my membrane if i realize hey wait a minute i'm sufficiently interconnected with so much outside of me that actually that in a sense is me that then suddenly those things I've been applying to only a small area of life start to get bigger and bigger and be applied to more things. Yeah, the 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 um, hearing you repeat it back kind of uh, or extend extend on it reminds me again about the McGilchrist piece and the right brain left brain. Um, in some sense, that is a different area of the membrane where I'm oriented kind of more than my sense of self from the left brain perspective. And as I expand into the right brain holistic thing, all of a sudden this, this smaller sense of myself becomes problematic. And, and there's something in the fascination, I think, whenever I read about experiences of split brain patients where one part of their body responds differently or, or the way that one part of that one hemisphere perceives differently than the other, that has that same kind of existential disgust or that my, uh, discomfort of, Oh my God, who am I? Am I, am I, do I know who I am? Um, I'm, I'm fighting against myself in some way. Um, and there's something of a, rather than respond to that repugnance with kind of shying away from it, looking into it. And, um, and, it, and it makes me wonder if something of um, the part that, that John mentions, which is kind of interesting that I don't remember from the first time watching this, when Diogenes masturbates in public, there's something of that confronting the aspect of, yeah, this is not an immoral act. It is a purity code, but we, you know, I want to face the part of me that doesn't, that wants to hide. I mean, there's, there's, there's something in it that is like, um, I, I still want to say there's something wrong with that. And yet I can't, quite find the flaw really there's something there's something that 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 the, the splinter is deeper under the surface than that this is such a funny discussion for me i can't like I, it, it's it's difficult and i can't quite put my words to it but there's something along the lines of of i don't know a personality type uh, uh, that uh, my personality type that looks at this and doesn't it doesn't have a whole lot of threshold for this feeling of disgust what, what what are we calling it the um i said i said existential uh, nausea <laughs> no the actual <laughs> reference of what it's for, purity, for, codes? purity codes code? purity codes yeah there's something funny that happens with that because i i have to like constantly police myself in reference to other people's purity codes because i don't i will cross lines without knowing it and and a lot of my behaviors and 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 like decisions are based off of other people's reaction to it not out of the, not out of what i deem to be disgusting in itself you know what i mean so 
and and yet when someone breaks those rules i'm not disgusted i'm more entertained by it like I, i'm actually kind of like whoa if i saw a guy masturbating in public i'd just start laughing and just like staring at it i wouldn't actually be disgusted by it just like the spit thing i'd be like because there's something so interesting in the social experiment of what's happening when someone breaks all those rules and everyone's shocked in a room but i'm i find this to be such a weird and interesting conversation because i don't really know I, I don't really know what it is. I, um, I do, I do, and I don't. Like, there's a friend of mine who's who just started eating raw organs and raw meat. He's like a kind of a health nut, and he just swears by all these weird health things. And I, you know, everyone's just reacting and like so grossed out in his Facebook. And I kind of thought, like, that sounds right. I kind of want to try that, <laughs> but. But I wouldn't for for the reason of how people would react to it because I don't I don't need that extra of like I don't need to be extra weird you know out there in the world. You can do weird in private. Yeah. Anyway, but a yeah. good therapeutic therapeutic movie I, I saw it a couple of days ago with, again is American Beauty. Oh with yeah. Kevin, Kevin Spacey. <laughs> that's that's about breaking every kind of rule. Just to, you know, reach a rebirth of some kind, out of you know, lose the desperation. Maybe go into in, in, in a new desperation, but at least leave the old one. <laughs> so, and he masturbates in the shower in the beginning, so, and that's a high point of his day, is it? So, so, and that's kind of sad. So, but a, a very excellent movie of of just breaking out of the 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 standard, um, you know, what people. Uh, uh, one from you. I'm wondering if if everyone, if anyone else in this group or in the chat feels the way I f described about this, where they're like trying and I, and trying I, to imitate what r r real people do, <laughs> not actually like doing this from some sort of internal place. In some way, yes, it's a it's a different um, it's a different. Um, aspect of it um, but there's something of for me it has something to do with vulnerability I, I notice I, I notice that I do have a different orientation to um, I, I say I have a different orientation to shame I don't think of shame as I think of shame more as a as a compass type thing of like oh there's a funny feeling here that points me to something that other people don't like and it's and it, and it is it's kind of akin to what you're noticing, that it's not necessarily that I wouldn't do it. It's just I notice that other people don't like this, so it's so I don't I don't personalize it as much as I recognize. Oh, there's a cultural norm against this. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's something that uh, reminds me so much in what you're saying of um, like the sects uh, in Hinduism and Buddhism that that do you know eat drink blood and eat raw meat and cover themselves in the ash from the crematoria and do all of these uh impure rituals as a practice and it's part of their their um their spiritual growth and their spiritual development and I, it it seems like if if purity codes are say an extension of natural protections against illness then as one lets go of the ego and the fear of death then one would be less sensitive to those kind of things that's my guess um yeah, but it, it I... seems very i mean i personally like the drinking of the spit caused a visceral disgust <laughs> in me it's... But the story about the masturbation, I was like, huh, like, it would be really weird if I came on this talk today and, like, took my shirt off. But I, I could do that. Like, that, that <laughs> kind of fascinates me, that idea. <laughs> like, it's just like there's some, like, there's some code I could violate, and it's not immoral. And there's some kind of, like, there's some kind of weird draw to exploring the apex of Heather's spiritual area, growth right. on this yeah. <laughs> live stream. <laughs> <laughs> but just that those things aren't um, 
like they seem so impossible to violate and yet they're they're not they're they're not real right to the the lecture like what is real that those aren't in fact real things they're there's some kind of overlay That quieted everyone down really fast. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking about the this thing I've been repeating in my head for a long time of um, find the ba actually as we cover it in the course to find the evolutionary basis of the behavior you're exhibiting right now or the behavior you're noticing in someone else. Why would we behave that way? And it's just become a habit, and it, it's like the the prevention of disease that's present. I mean, I don't like it, you know, I don't like using the same knife to cut chick raw chicken as I do to cut uh, vegetables. Like I'll wash that. And I have a feeling of disgust about that. But the cultural stuff just doesn't, I don't even think about it anymore. You know? Um, yeah, I think that's yeah. a, uh, the thinking of, of kind of the evolutionary basis is really interesting because just now I went to change my baby's diaper and I was thinking about that, how I actually do not get the disgust response at all when doing it. And there's an evolutionary reason for oh, it. I'm so glad you brought that up. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking about that during <laughs> the lecture, how that's one of the most notable changes for me is like the baby just completely shat on me the other day and I had to change all of my clothes. It was just an explosion. And I just was not reacting to it like i used to be just so disgusted by that kind of stuff like i even thinking about changing a diaper was like no and then yeah after he was born that's one thing that's been really changed is my disgust level is just non-existent with that stuff hi happy about it thanks by the way oh. <laughs> oh, David, you, you got me you got me to patrick Were you going to say something, Patrick? No, no, no. It, 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 well, one note here is that regarding the cynics that really puzzled me is that learn to set your heart on the things that are not man-made, the natural laws and, 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 and maybe the moral laws. But that confuses me because, of, I mean, much of, like you said now, you don't care about how, how much the baby shits on you. It, it's like... Yeah, I'd prefer and, not. And, no, <laughs> Let's I, be I clear know. about that. <laughs> I know I, I've had to, so that's shattering. So it's like, but 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 that confused me because I, I think if we only focus on on the things that are not man-made, then then we miss much of the meaning in life because m much of the meaning that we build is is like going back to uh, what Epicurus said that meaning of friendship is you know, philosophical friendship. So I, I'm just trying to, again, and I can understand where this is taking us. But I think it was a much more calm and friendly talk today and a bit more puzzled talk today. It's like, where, 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 where is taking it? I think next, next time, I think it's the Stoics and, and Jesus for some kind of reason. Yeah. The, and that, that's, that's cool. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I really get the sense from this, this discussion well, more, more the lecture and then the resulting discussion that it's setting up for something yeah. that I don't know is coming. It just seems we're in kind of a transition into some other interesting subjects. That's good. Anyway, um, okay. thank you guys for joining. Um, I hope thank that was you. entertaining this week, and we will do this again next Monday. Yeah. Cool. See you guys. Bye. Take care, friends. Thank you. Bye. All right. Have a good day. Thanks. Thanks.